you. Well, I mean, when you take cancer as a whole, um, we know that the commonest ones are lung cancer, which is pretty sorted. You know, if we stopped smoking, there'd be virtually no lung cancer at all. So sort of I'll cast that aside. But the next top um, cancers that uh, will we'll get most of us will be prostate cancer in men, um, breast cancer in women, and colorectal cancer. So those are the three big ones um, that really have had a lot of um, studies directed towards the aspects which could be um, preventable. And certainly um, we know that four out of 10 cancers, which include those cancers, could be prevented by um, adoption of a healthy diet and, mm. and lifestyle. So I think there's a great impact to be made by making um, healthy diet and lifestyle choices on the cancers that you're most likely to get, you know. On the Healthy Human Revolution podcast, Dr. Lori Marbus interviews nutrition and lifestyle medicine experts and extraordinary guests whose informative and inspiring stories will empower you with the knowledge to transform your life and health. Hi, I'm Dr. Lori Marbus, and welcome to the Healthy Human Revolution podcast. I'm super excited to have Dr. Shireen Kassam here with us today. Here are you. Yeah, I'm well, thank you, Laurie. Thanks for inviting me. Well, thank you for coming. This is uh, it's really exciting because your specialty of oncology is such an important topic and one that can be hotly debated. But before we dive into some topics of interest, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you found a plant-based diet? Yeah, for sure. So thanks. Um, my name is Shireen Kassam, and I work here in the UK as a consultant hematologist, and I specialize in treating people um, with lymphoma. Um, and um, I found a plant-based diet back in 2013 now, I think it was. And more on a personal level, you know, I'd been vegetarian since 2001, but not necessarily a very conscious vegetarian. So decided I didn't need to or want to eat meat anymore, but hadn't really thought very much beyond that. Um, but then somehow in terms of discussing with uh, my sisters, for example, or just looking at um, online information, it became clear that I no longer wanted to support the um, egg and dairy industry either because for animal um, welfare issues, um, you couldn't justify being vegetarian. Um, so I became vegan for the ethical reasons. Um, but then as you do, you sort of look into how um, you should be eating on a personal level and what's healthy and what's the science. And I just, it just opened the door to this amazing wealth of information about plant-based diets and its role in promoting health, preventing disease, and even potentially reversing. And I was hooked, totally hooked. Um, and that sort of um, led me to sort of thinking in the UK, like, why is nobody talking about this? Um, you know, I hadn't really come across anyone using plant-based diets um, in the kind of clinical practice area. So mm. I started putting out feelers and trying to connect with like-minded people and, uh, you know, a few years down the line, we've got quite a growing network of health professionals here in the UK that are promoting and using plant-based diets in clinical practice. Which is phenomenal. So we can just kind of dive into the organization that you developed and kind of where your vision is for that. Yeah, um, so in 2017, um, I decided to um, found an organization called Plant-Based Health Professionals UK, um, which is registered here as a community interest company, which is kind of the equivalent of the US sort of non-profit organization. And we have a simple mission, which is to provide evidence-based education on whole food plant-based diets for disease prevention and treatment. Um, and we, we focus predominantly on health professionals, but we have educational events and information for the general public. And obviously the ambition is really to be able to contribute to policy um, within the UK. Um, and I say, and the goal is, is simple. I just want to be like organizations like the Plantrition Project or PCRM, <laughs> but they've got many years ahead of us. So we're sort of slowly um, chugging along, trying to um, build a network of um, our members, which is growing rapidly and providing, you know, good quality education um, within, within that field. Because as far as I know, there isn't any other health professional body sort of teaching on plant-based diets here in the UK. 
Very good. Yeah, well, the plantation's only, I think, six or seven years, and it grows rapidly, mm -hmm. especially in this climate. I can imagine there's a huge interest in, in what you're doing. And yeah, um, yeah, no, I think so. And we only started membership about 18 months ago, having oh, wow. very little to offer our members, but we're over 400 members now. And, wow. you know, it's an active group. Um, and, and, you know, with a bit of uh, pushing and advertising, I'm sure we can uh, reach many more. So, um, yeah, Excellent. it's been, it's been a, a great opportunity. That's fantastic. I love that. And I, I wasn't aware that that was such a growing uh, proportion of, you know, the health professionals in the UK, which is exciting that we're not, you know, just standing over here alone in North America, <laughs> pushing yeah, this agenda. Cool. <laughs> yeah, <never laughs> cool. That's good. Um, so then you also teach a course um, at the university. Could you tell us a little bit about that? That's exciting yeah. too. Yeah, it is. So I've teamed up with Winchester University, where I now work one day a week. Um, and it was one of these sort of um, lucky um, introductions by uh, a friend um, who went to the same university as the vice chancellor of Winchester University, who happens to be vegan and has surrounded oh, wow. herself by fellow vegan members of staff. So she was quite interested to to meet me. And, um, you know, I said the UK needs to offer a course on plant based um, nutrition because nobody's doing it in the university setting, you know, there's no sort of credible course. Um, so didn't hear much for two months and then suddenly a contract arrived saying you know, two year contract with a view to, to, you know, developing a course. I was like, all right then. <laughs> and it, it was good timing because they were in the process of opening their faculty of health and well-being. So um, it's been almost a year that that faculty has been open. So they they also offer healthcare related degree programs like nursing and physiotherapy and, and mm. dietetics is going to start in the coming years. So it sort of fitted in with their, their whole um, holistic sort of health program uh, as well. And I really warm to the institution and the individuals there because, you know, their core values are social justice and sustainability. So it really sort of resonates um, with me because, you know, our diet choices are not just about our personal health. It sort of impacts very much on global health of people and animals and, and they appreciate that interaction. So, so yeah, so I developed a course. It took a while because they don't actually have any other online courses apart from this one at the oh. moment. So it was sort of doing everything for the first time, but now it's up and running for a whole year. We've um, in the in the third running at the moment and it's been hugely popular and um, six weeks online and uh, I'll, I'll share the links with you so you can share it with your viewers it's yeah. open to everyone worldwide and okay. as I said your colleague Michael Clapper has taken it so if you want the lowdown then uh, you can uh, find out from him what he thought. <laughs> oh I'm sure it was as phenomenal so because I mean you're also an MD PhD. <laughs> uh, yes yeah I went through that sort of uh, yeah PhD program doing my um, hematology training it sort wow. of seems to be the thing that people do in the UK and I think partly for haematology, what attracted me was that sort of overlap between clinical and pathology, you know, we're the mm. only specialty that still does both, you know, I look yeah. down the microscope at blood films and bone marrows and look at ge genomic results and all that and then go and see the patient where you've made the diagnosis and, and what have you. So it's that in overlap that sort of lends itself to doing sort of more um, science and lab based um, research and wow. and actually in hindsight I hadn't given my research much thought to be honest at the time in that I applied for a position it was within cancer pharmacology at um, Bart's Healthcare, um, Bart's Cancer Centre it was and um, they were interested in looking at the impact of high doses of selenium mm. in the treatment of patients with um, lymphoma because there was um, some uh, laboratory data and some clinical data in colorectal cancer at the time suggesting that you know supranutritional doses of selenium could sensitize cancer cells to chemotherapy you know mm. with very low toxicity of you know selenium which in you know for a few weeks at high doses doesn't really cause much toxicity um, so it's interesting that looking back now it did have a sort of nutritional component to it yes so absolutely a long -time thyroid health cholesterol selenium. I, yeah. <laughs> um, fascinating. So that's really cool. Yeah, selenium is an interesting element. Um, it is. It is. Those Brazil nuts. Just eat those Brazil Indeed. nuts. Just <laughs> one a day and you're, you're sorted. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You can get a little too much. Um, as far as your, your work, I'm really curious 
how, when you started moving to a plant-based diet and discovering the um, overwhelming evidence of how helpful this is to just human health, uh, and of course, along with uh, animal welfare and the, and the global health, what did you start to do? Like, how did you proceed? Because I know it, I had to stumble through a little bit to figure out how to do this with patients. How did you proceed and what does that evolve to? What does a day in the, in the clinic with you look like when you're speaking yeah. to patients regarding this? Yeah, well, I, I guess, you know, in the setting that I work in, which is with lymphoma, there isn't a very direct um, link between um, diet and health, health behaviors and the risk of lymphoma. Although, you know, there's hints um, to suggest that there, there might be um, some uh, aspects of our diet and lifestyle. But I think the thing that really interested me for the patients I treat are that, you know, obviously um, lymphoma is more a disease of older people or more common in the older, or older person. And the patients that I see have those same comorbidities that you're seeing every day in your clinic. So heart disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, you know, quite a prevalence of overweight and obesity. And sadly, these um, comorbidities are impacting the types of treatment that I can give because although I'm lucky enough that a lot of common lymphomas are curable or have long, you know, life expectancies, um, you know, their, their treatments can often be quite toxic to the heart, the lungs, um, and you know we use a lot of high dose steroids, as you know, which then you know cause diabetes to go completely out of control. So I think that's kind of the area that interests me really is to sort of optimize health in individuals who are going to need chemotherapy, mm. and and then the second aspect is then the whole survivorship um, aspect. You know we know that people who are cured from lymphoma still don't live as long as the normal population. Um, they die early of heart disease and second cancers, um, you know, wow. the same illnesses, um, but just earlier because of the toxicity of the chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So I think there's a real chance to impact outcomes um, with diet and lifestyle approaches for survivorship, but we're, we're really in the early stages and there's not much money in it as you might imagine. You know, we discharge yeah. people back to their family physicians after two, three years of follow up. You know, you're cured, well done, and you know, make sure you live a healthy life, and, and that's about it. So I've, I, I don't have much time in my clinical um, uh, sessions for that, but what I do is signposting. So everyone asks about diet and supplements and what can I do because it's the only thing that um, patients actually have control over. You know, we take over their lives for six to eight months and demand them coming up to hospital, having blood tests, having treatments, um, but sort of diet and, and exercise and things is something that they can take charge of. So it's really just talking about healthy diets and trying to make those small changes and figuring out, you know, what their baseline diet is and just trying to then optimize in the confines of, of what you can with, with chemotherapy, you know, fruits and vegetables and de-emphasizing meat and dairy and, and replacing it with more healthful foods. But it's not without its challenges, you might imagine, you know, you turn somebody's life upside down for half a year. It's really quite hard for, for people to make these changes. Right, absolutely. So what cancers are going to be, you know, maybe directly impacted or have some influence by dietary regimens? What do you have any suggestions there for people to consider? Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I mean, when you take cancer as a whole, um, we know that the commonest ones are lung cancer, which is pretty sorted. You know, if we stopped smoking, there'd be virtually no lung cancer at all. So sort of I'll cast that aside. But the next top um, cancers that uh, will we'll get most of us will be prostate cancer in men, um, breast cancer in women, and colorectal cancer. So those are the three big ones um, that really have had a lot of um, studies directed towards the aspects which could be um, preventable. And certainly um, we know that four out of 10 cancers, which include those cancers, could be prevented by um, adoption of a healthy diet and, mm. and lifestyle. So I think there's a great impact to be made by making um, healthy diet and lifestyle choices on the cancers that you're most likely to get. You know, mm. you're not most likely to get lymphoma, you're most likely to get 
um, breast cancer, you know, one in seven women in their lifetime, um, prostate cancer is, um, is hugely prevalent as we age, as men age, and colorectal cancer, which sadly is on the rise in, in, in people under the age of 50, mm-hmm. um, with the hypothesis being that the, you know, the rising body weight and the westernization of the diet, the lack of fiber, is all leading to an earlier diagnosis of colorectal cancer, which is preventable in over 50% of cases. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, so we were discussing before we started that there's been a really useful document just out from the American Cancer Society. Um, and it really, in very plain language, goes through what we know about cancer prevention when it with, with its relationship to diet and physical activity. Um, And there is no doubt in my mind that a healthy plant-based diet is the best for cancer prevention. Um, There's no other diet that's come close um, to it or that we've studied for for long enough to know what the impact on cancer will Mm. be. Um, You know, it doesn't need to be 100%. I'd love to say that you had to be 100% uh, plant-based to derive all the benefits, but the reality is you have to be predominantly, that's sort of 85 to 90%, whole food plant-based and the 10%, well, you know, if you want to keep a bit of dairy and eggs and meat, then that's fine. But I think what we realize is that people aren't able to proportion their diets like that. And I I wouldn't be able to to just restrict um, a food in in that way. You know, when I was eating cheese, you you know, you remember how addictive it is and you Mm. can't quantify what that small amount is and you find you're eating it every day. So the simplest yeah. message, I think, is be as close to a whole food plant-based diet as you can. Absolutely. Yeah, that you covered, actually, I had a question regarding, you know, the colorectal cancer rise in the cohort of 18 to 35-year-olds. Mm-hmm. And um, when I mentioned that, because all three of my children are in their 20s, and so I, you know, I, I use that as a... a information to explain how important it is that we focus on our children's health. And um, you kind of answered as, as I always get asked questions, why? I'm like, well, let's look at our diet (laughs) and what we're doing. It has to be. Uh, Our genes have not changed in the last 50 years. They're not going to change rapidly enough to to account for that. But what we know is that how we live our lives, um, Mm -hmm. you know, both what we put into uh, ourselves, how we, you know, um, are very much indoors and very sedentary uh, on the whole. And of course, our environmental exposures, which, um, you know, sadly, we have little control over, but, um, you know, diet, we certainly do have intimate control over. Also, I mean, you know, you're looking at children and what are moms doing when they're pregnant and the diet that a a mother that's carrying a child um, in pregnancy is so very important as well. So we don't even begin to understand those implications. So. Absolutely, you know, and in the same way that sort of heart disease, you know, can start in your teenage years with evidence of atherosclerosis by the time you're in your 20s, I think, you know, those those little cells um, in your body and the organs that are going to get damaged and mm-hmm. sit there waiting to become cancerous really do mm-hmm. start decades before it presents clinically and mm-hmm. either you can, you know, have a diet that um, prevents that cell ever generating a cancer or you can you know fuel it with um, a diet that's inflammatory that's going to stress out the other cells that's going to cause those cells to grow because you've got high levels of estrogen and growth factors and insulin and all sorts of things so I think you know the earlier you start the better and 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 it's scary when you read the papers about how the health outcomes of babies that are intimately related to what we do antenatally, well, prenatally really, mm-hmm. and uh, antenatally. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a really it's a really interesting field. Yeah, absolutely. And then if you think about the generations that you affect, so when I was carrying my daughter, what I ate will affect her children because her her eggs are developed during the time that I'm pregnant with her. You know, she's 26 now, but I'm thinking to myself, how was I <laughs> doing back then? You know, so you really, it, it, it's striking to think about generational impact of what I choose, food choices that you're making every day. So, absolutely. But there is some good news there, though, that the studies have shown that you can actually change your gene expression, yes. you know, just because you passed down that gene that was on or off when it shouldn't have been, doesn't mean that you can't actually 
and you know we're understanding more and more how the foods impact the gene expression of the cancer cells there was a great study just i think it was at the end of last year in in science just showing how cruciferous vegetables actually turn um, on a tumor suppressor gene in prostate cancer cells you know and this is over a decade after dean ornish published his paper in early stages of uh, prostate, prostate cancer, cancer yeah. and yet now in the laboratory we can show that you know these cells can be switched on and off just by you know adding adding um, broccoli <laughs> yeah broccoli and kale you know it's crazy isn't it <laughs> yes absolutely oh my goodness and so I guess I'd like to dive into a little bit um, you know I get a lot of questions regarding soy and cancer risk and could you just kind of you know dispel the myths or you know tell us what science is telling us as far as the safety or not safety of, of soy products yeah no i mean i think the 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 answer to that is really simple the the science is consistent now that consuming soya in a minimally processed form so that means things like tofu or the edamame beans or tempeh or miso really has a protective effect against cancer and particularly sort of hormone driven cancers like breast cancer and prostate cancer so regarding breast cancer you know um, soya is clever it can act in um, different um, parts of the body in different ways so certainly for breast um, in, and in the breast it has an anti-estrogenic effect and it certainly reduces the risk of developing breast cancer, especially if you start eating soya in adolescence. So the earlier you start, the better really. And it's such a good source of so many nutrients that there's no reason why you wouldn't want to start um, you know, feeding your child soya as soon as you start weaning, to be honest. You know, mm -hmm. it's a great source of protein. It's got calcium, omega-3 fats, um, and uh, you know, uh, lots of other um healthy um foods and of course fiber um so um yeah so it's, it's preventative for breast cancer but i think what's really exciting is also that there is a small amount of evidence to suggest that it could help um, manage side effects during cancer treatments um, when you're undergoing breast cancer treatments um, and then for survivorship there certainly is a reduced risk of the breast cancer coming back um, if you're consuming um, uh, soya, soya foods. Um, and, and often, you know, soya is eaten instead of dairy. You know, we sort of think of soya like the soya milk and the um, tofu and things as alternatives to dairy. And when you compare the two, there's just no comparison. Like you're so much better switching out your dairy and replacing it by soya for both breast cancer and prostate cancer. Um, health. Um, so there is there is no doubt in my mind that soya is a healthy food. And of course, it's heart, heart healthy as well. Mm -hmm. You know, um, David Jenkins in Toronto and his portfolio diet, it was, you know, it had soya in it. it it's got a heart, heart healthy label. So right. um, it's sort of win-win for cancer and, and heart disease. It's also important for bone health as well, some yeah, other things. Yeah. Um, so what would you suggest as far as um, servings. I also get that question often, yeah. how much is too much or too little? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a serving of most sort of fruits and vegetables and legumes and things is around the sort of 80 grams uh, mark. Um, and, you know, up to three times a day is absolutely fine. So, you know, if you use soy milk in your smoothie, for example, uh, or have some edamame beans with your lunch salad, and then you know, some tofu uh, or tempeh with your stir fry in the evening, that would be totally fine. I mean, I think in reality, most people aren't going to be eating three portions a day. But, you know, I think, you know, including some soya every day in, in a minimally processed form is really beneficial. Perfect. Okay. And then, you know, you also mentioned, um, if we could maybe speak to like we talked a little bit about breast cancer and so is there anything other with the colon cancer like is there a number of grams of fiber or is there certain elements of a plant-based diet that you um, are aware of the, to share with us that will decrease that risk um, or yeah. mitigate you know recurrence yeah so i think you, you know you you've, you've said it as it is really for colon cancer it really is the fiber mm -hmm. um and you know i know in the uk that um the average person is eating about 19 grams of fiber a day i, I don't know what it is in the us but 12 um, to 15. oh okay you know we're, we are, we're leaders in america here <laughs> 
And um, there's been nice studies done showing the more the better. And basically, if you can get up to 30 to 40 grams of fiber a day, um, you can almost halve your risk of um, developing colorectal cancer. And I think you can probably only get to 30, 40 grams a day if you're eating predominantly plant-based. You know, you have to be eating a whole food plant-based diet to get to that 40 grams a day. Um, yeah, I push it towards 60 most days with what I'm oh eating. Um, but I eat all plants, but um, I love beans. I grew up eating beans, I eat a lot of beans. <laughs> yeah, so. no, for sure. And beans, uh, along with the soya, have been shown yeah. to have um, really good anti-cancer properties. But it, it's really just eating the fruits and vegetables. And I think the other exciting development in the cancer field is um, we're realizing why fiber is so good because it you know, it benefits the health of the gut microbiome. And not only does a healthy gut microbiome help prevent cancer, it's becoming um, clear now that um, a healthy gut microbiome could help you respond better to certain anti-cancer therapies. Mm. Um, so just in the last year, there's been a number of publications um, showing that those with the healthiest gut microbes respond best to immune type therapies. So there's a new class of drugs um, acting on our immune system and those with a healthy gut um, bacteria have better outcomes, more remissions, live longer. So, you know, I think even if you have a diagnosis of cancer, um, you know, you can really impact your chances by upping fruits and vegetables and all the whole plant foods with lots of fiber. You know, this, it kind of, um, maybe I should have started this conversation with this question, but maybe we can, maybe people don't even understand what cancer is. So can you just kind of give a description of what cancer is and why dietary interventions, especially in certain ones, you know, 40%, like you're discussing, mm -hmm. is so important. So what, what is going on there? Yeah, well, I guess in really simple terms, you know, uh, cancer is a dysregulated growth of essentially one cell that has gone awry for whatever reason. So it's um, had some form of damage to it, such that the DNA has been damaged and it no longer behaves as it should do in that organ. So, if, so within the gut, a single cell could be damaged by the fact that you know, you're eating processed meat, for example, it could have damaged the DNA and that cell is now um, you know, sitting there behaving abnormally. Now, our body has its own way of getting rid of these damaged cells. We've got a really good way of, of detoxifying our body and getting rid of cells that, that no longer function as they should. And most of the time that's functioning really well, but occasionally these cells linger. And there may be several of these being formed all the time. Every minute, you know, our, our cells are being, uh, are taking a hit and damaging DNA. And most of the time the body gets rid of it. But when it doesn't, they can sit there in, in the gut lining. And what we then do to that cell um, really impacts whether it can grow or not. So it's not going to just grow if we don't give it the right growth environment. Um, it needs nutrients. It needs, um, you know, uh, the ability to switch on the genes to make the cells divide and grow and become a clinically apparent um, tumor or swelling as it were. So, um, and that process from the original damaged cell to becoming a problem in our bowel or in our breast or prostate can take decades. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and during those decades where those cells could be growing and proliferating, we have the chance to either have a diet um, that um, inhibits the growth of these abnormal cells, or we can give it a diet that's full of growth hormone and insulin, like growth factor and estrogens that are going to boost the growth of these abnormal cells until it becomes a clinical problem. So, mm. um, yeah, and, and, you know, the definition of cancer is that it is derived from a single cell. It's a clonal population of cells that have grown um, and, and um, become dysfunctional. And then at the later stages, obviously, it, 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 it um, travels outside of its original organ mm. to other uh, parts of the, the body. And, and by that stage, it's very difficult to do anything um, really substantial with, with diet and lifestyle. Gotcha. And um, 
So I'm sure you get questions you had mentioned earlier, supplementation. Should you be taking supplementation? If so, which ones and what ones to avoid? Because um, some can actually been you know, like beta carotene and increased risk of certain types of cancers. Can you talk to that? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, as, as best we can, we should be getting all our nutrients from the foods we eat. And that's the optimal um, advice really, even if you have a diagnosis of cancer and certainly for cancer prevention, all the nutrients that have been associated with cancer prevention um, are best eaten as a whole food. Because as you say, when we've tried to isolate these nutrients like vitamin A and vitamin E and even selenium was a bit of a bust when it came to preventing prostate cancer and actually did some harm, um, you know, it's never been successful. So eat the whole food and get plenty of micronutrients and antioxidants and anti-inflammatories from your food. Um, the, I guess the only caveat to that is that if you're on a 100% plant-based diet, then you need a reliable source of um, B12. And for most of us, and for me included, I take a B12 supplement. Um, so I think that's the main advice for 100% plant-based or vegan diet. So when it comes to cancer prevention, again, there hasn't been any um, studies demonstrating that supplements will help. But I think um, the only one that um, is useful to know your level of and then supplement if you're low is vitamin D. Mm -hmm. um, because although the data are not conclusive, there's been a large meta-analysis showing that those that have an optimal vitamin D level during cancer treatment have a better chance of being in remission and surviving. So it's quite a simple one. And the fact is, you know, with our covered up clothing and our indoor working, most of us are not getting enough vitamin D. And I measure vitamin D levels in all my patients and all of them are lower than the, um, you know, the range that's considered sufficient. So I think vitamin D is well worth taking um, if you're not getting enough sunlight. Um, and, and there is a possibility that that can um, impact your outcomes to cancer treatment. But beyond that, I think during cancer treatment, you should be very cautious um, and only be supplementing if you really can't get in, enough of, uh, of your nutrition. And that needs to be done with a cancer dietitian um, because you need to go through your diet history and, and diet, uh, the diet, diet diary to and figure out what you might be missing out on. Because a, pub, a study published earlier this year, actually in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, looked at just this question in a large um, study of patients with breast cancer. They did a secondary analysis asking patients what supplements they were taking. And those who were taking um, supplements, particularly with antioxidant supplements like vitamin C and vitamin E, um, actually had a worse outcome to therapy. Um, now, again, this isn't conclusive and you could think that, well, maybe the people with the worst type of cancer were more likely to be taking the supplements and that's why they did, they did worse. But I think it just comes back to the precautionary principle and until we know it's safe and it's necessary, then we shouldn't be taking over-the-counter supplements of nutrients that we could be getting from food. Mm, absolutely. And then as far as, you know, other recommendations for cancer prevention, what other lifestyle modifications do you recommend or does evidence show that's been beneficial? Yeah, well, the top one is always, you know, don't smoke cigarettes. It's a big no-no. And I think finally the public health messaging is getting out there. Um, but, you know, sadly, second to tobacco smoking, um, being um, overweight is a, a, a now considered the second top risk factor for developing cancer and you know here in the UK two-thirds of the population are overweight so really trying to maintain a healthy weight is key for preventing cancer and you know you and I know that the diet associated with the most chance of being a healthy weight is one that's centered around whole plant foods that avoids most animal foods and doesn't eat um, processed foods. So, um, you know, plant-based diets on top there. Um, and then consuming plenty of fruits and vegetables, you know, um, we're not eating enough. Um, less than a third of people in the UK actually consume five portions of fruits and vegetable a day. I mean, it's crazy, wow. isn't it? Wow. So really upping fruits and vegetables um, is the key change that you can make, not only for your fiber, for, but for all those amazing nutrients that are cancer preventing. Um, and then, um, uh, 
it, you know, people don't like to hear this, but alcohol causes cancer. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And I was actually really pleased to see in this latest guideline that they, they clearly state from the American Cancer Society that do not drink alcohol for cancer prevention. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we have to be honest with ourselves and with our patients. And then you make a decision that fits with your, um, you know, your own choices. But, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, around five and a half percent of cancers globally are caused by um, the consumption of alcohol. Um, and then, you know, physical activity can't be underestimated. You know, everything we've said about um, diet could be replaced with the words physical activity. You know, it helps maintain a healthful weight. It reduces insulin resistance. It reduces inflammation. Um, and it's been shown to be protective for, you know, over 14 different cancers it helps people respond better to treatment for cancer, and it also helps you stay in remission longer and survive longer after after treatment if you're if you're um, taking part in regular, consistent physical activity. and And the guidelines are about 150 minutes a, a week of moderately moderately intense physical activity. Um, and you know, the more the better. There's a dose response with all these healthful behaviours. The more you do, the better. But aim for you know that half an hour a day. Um, which is, is is sort of more manageable, um, and it doesn't have to be you know marathon, you know running or whatever. It just needs to be brisk walking or a bit of jo jogging or um, what have you. Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't have to be a solid half hour block. You could do ten, three tens, just getting mm -hmm. more active in general yeah. um, is very important. Yeah, and even if you do that thirty minutes a day, but sit on. Uh, you know, sit on a chair all day long, that still doesn't quite negate the impact of a sedentary lifestyle. Yeah. So, you know, our, our new life of sitting at a computer all day is just really not doing us any good. Especially in the last three to four months. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually have a, a walking desk under, I have a, a desk that elevates up and down, and then I have a walking treadmill underneath mm -hmm. it. So, um, I alternate between sitting and walking and standing all day, and um, mm -hmm. that's been very helpful. Um, and it's just a, a stress relief, too, not to just mm -hmm. be sitting all day, your back and everything stretching yeah. and, and all that. Um, and I, you know, as an oncologist, hematologist as well, um, you know, I get a lot of questions regarding anemia, iron, mm -hmm. those type of things. Do you have any suggestions, thoughts, um, maybe clarifications on helping people understand what's important to um, maybe mitigate the iron deficiency anemia if you're eating a plant-based diet? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you know, as, as we know, anemia is a broad um, uh, term, <clears throat> you know, used to encompass a lot of diseases that cause a re reduction in the hemoglobin, so the red cells that are carrying oxygen around the body. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, you know, micronutrient or nutrient deficiencies such as iron deficiency, B12 and folate, are the commonest causes of an anemia. Um, and obviously, you know, if somebody uh, presents with a low iron levels, um, one needs to make um, a good go at finding out why. And, you know, blood loss is going to be the most common cause. So you want to look for blood loss that's out with the norm. So obviously for women, it's quite common um, during um, you know, the premenopausal period, as in like when you're men menstruating to have iron deficiency anemia, but outside of you know, losing it through menstrual um, loss, there is no way the body can lose iron. So I think that's the key. It's not um, usually just a, a nutritional issue. And we know from studies that uh, meat eaters and vegetarians don't really have a different risk of, of developing iron deficiency, you know, so it's not like vegetarians are more likely to become iron deficient. So you still need to go through the whole algorithm of investigating iron deficiency and figuring out why someone is iron deficient. And then if you know the reason and you want to increase your iron um, uh, in the diet, um, then yeah, you need to concentrate on, on um, some dietary approaches. Um, but just going back a step, it, it's all, you also have to be mindful that sometimes we do need 
iron supplements. You know, I think sometimes in pregnancy, you know, people are reluctant to take iron supplements. But, you know, if your iron levels are below the normal range, um, then you're likely to have to take a short period of iron supplementation. It can be quite difficult to um, compensate um, to getting back into the normal range by just the dietary approach. But sort of once you are back in the normal range, then you can maintain it quite well with making sure your diet is optimal. And on a plant-based diet, as you know, it's sort of greens and beans are really good um, sources of iron. And, you know, you want to promote the absorption of iron. So you can do that by adding vitamin C sources or any um, source of acid. So, um, you know, lemon juice or orange or even, you know, your, your, your food um, dinner will be full of broccoli and red peppers that will have vitamin C in it and avoid the things that stop you absorbing the iron. So calcium supplements um, and also um, teas and coffees. So the polyphenols and, and tannins um, reduce the absorption of iron. So there's just some tricks to be done. And, you know, there's easy find lists of high iron foods on the, on the internet you know you just need to concentrate on doing that and and making sure you're not taking any inhibitors uh, uh, of iron at the at the same time but as i say there's no reason why you can't be, replete your iron stores and keep them there with a with a healthy plant-based approach um, and and it's, it's fair to say that the iron in plant foods is much healthier than the iron in animal foods you know heme iron is one of the reasons why red and processed meat um, it is causing cancer. It causes oxidative stress, damages DNA. So really the plant sources are a much healthier source of iron. So you, I think that's a great segue. You touched upon, you know, one of the reasons animal type foods can increase risk of cancer. Are there others associated with animal products that increase risk for cancers? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, just starting with the worst food that we could have for cancer, and that would be the processed red meat, you know, things like bacon, sausages and salami and even deli meat. Um, it's mainly the nitrates and the nitrites um, that are used in the preservatives of these meats and mainly to sort of give it colour, but also to um, prevent botulism. You know, I'm not sure anyone wants botulism in their food, but uh, from their food. But uh, anyway, so the nitrates and nitrites get converted into and nitroso compounds in the gut, which then damage DNA. Um, so, so that's the main reason for processed meats. And people always talk about, um, you know, well, you can remove the nitrate um, from from the from the um, processed meat, and why don't we use other chemicals and non-cancerous ones? But it's just there is no need, and you know, they're often high in salt, um, which can contribute to high risk of gastric cancer. Um, and, uh, you know, they're devoid of any nutrients that will help prevent cancer. So processed meat and red meat don't have any useful antioxidants or the plant uh, phytochemicals that are needed to prevent cancer. And they cause inflammation regardless of the nitrates and nitrites. Red meat and processed meat causes inflammation in the body. Um, and, and that can promote um, cancer too. And then cooking meat, um, it doesn't matter what type of meat, in fact, um, poultry generate more carcinogens on cooking at high heat. So these heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are formed and they again damage DNA. Um, um, so those are the main mechanisms, heme iron, the carcinogens that when you cook and the nitrates and nitrites. Um, but um, the, the other reason why um, a, a sort of plant-based diet is optimal is because it lowers growth hormones in the body um, and the opposite is true of a meat heavy diet so mm -hmm. insulin like growth factor particularly is lower in in individuals that are eating mostly plant foods and that growth hormone in, in particular has been associated with high risks of um, most cancers actually um, uh, particularly prostate cancer, but also breast cancer and colorectal cancer. And you can lower it within just a few weeks by adopting a healthy diet and, 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 and doing regular exercise. Wow. And then what about dairy products in particular or casein or others? Any thoughts there? Yeah, yeah so I, I, it's difficult with dairy, isn't it? Because I think it always comes down to instead of what. So some people who are consuming, you know, if, if somebody swaps out 
um, you know, sodas and sweet, sugar sweetened beverages for, for dairy, they might be improving their health a bit. But if you're using eating cheese and milk instead of your fruits and vegetables and your high fiber foods, then you're not going to improve your, your health. So the studies haven't been 100% consistent when it comes to um, cancer prevention. I think where it's clear is that dairy is contributing to the risk of prostate cancer for that reason that we said about the IGF-1. Um, so dairy is linked with a high risk of prostate cancer and a high risk of aggressive prostate cancer. Um, so I think for men it's a no-no and as I say for other cancers there's better choices to make you know so instead of drinking cow's milk or any sort of dairy milk you should be aiming for soya for example because that actively reduces the risk of developing cancer and that's what the studies have shown and I think we have to remember that you know most of the world's population is lactose intolerant and so dairy isn't even consumed in these populations or shouldn't be consumed because it's probably causing ill health um, because of that lactose intolerance um, and you're right in, in laboratory studies for sure casein and whey protein and things have been shown to um, enhance the growth of cancer cells and certainly there's no need to put a fluid in your body that is enhancing the growth of cancer in, in, inside our cells but um, I think that's been quite difficult to prove that it actually happens in humans um, uh, apart from the associations that I mentioned so I think it would be too strong to say dairy causes cancer full stop but it is certainly associated with a high risk of prostate cancer and there's certainly much better um, choices to make. Um, and then when you bring along all the other um, uh, uh, sort of pollutants or constituents of dairy, like the estrogen, the bovine growth hormone, the antibiotics, the persistent organic pollutants, and putting that all together, it just, I can't see how it becomes a, a healthy or necessary um, part of a, a, of a diet. And honestly, if you think about what cow's milk is made to do, is to grow a calf to a thousand pounds in a year, whatever the equivalent kilograms is, why would we want to ingest that as a human? <laughs> so there's many things that just the factors that are there, I mean, it's just, it just, it doesn't correlate um, just in a, yeah. a normal, logical manner. So, um, and then there is, this has been a great conversation. Is there any final advice for, for those who are maybe, um, you know, I, I the, the other, well, I, I say I should have one more question actually. So I get a lot of questions also regarding mammograms and colonoscopies and the preventive measures that have been shown to decrease, um, you know, aggressive breast cancer because they catch them early or colon cancers. What is your thoughts or your recommendations for individuals who are seeking advice, whether they should proceed or what the age is? I mean, I know what I tell my patients, I say we, this is a personal discussion we discuss, we look at your risk factors and we make that decision. And um, certainly those have their place, but in my mind, but any thoughts or suggestions there? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really difficult topic, isn't it? And I think yes. it really does come down to making a personal decision based on the available evidence and right. you, you know I think sometimes the true impact of some of these screening tools are not always transparent to uh -huh. or, or even doctors because you know if your country starts a screening program you know the UK screens you know all women between 50 and 70 then it's our duty as a doctor to refer for those screening programs. So I think it can be tough. And I think at the end of the day, it really has to be a weighing up of risks and benefits and an individual's outlook on how they assess those risks. We can't judge how people will, but I would say that it's one aspect of cancer prevention. I think um, the downside of these screening tools is it sort of removes the responsibility of the individual and mm. Um, makes us feel that, you know, the way to prevent cancer is to get a mammogram and to get your prostate specific antigen test measured and to have a colonoscopy. And if they're all clear, I won't get cancer. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just one aspect of a cancer prevention strategy, which has to start with our own individual behaviors. Um, and then 
based on that, um, you then go forward and decide whether a screening test is um, of value to you. And certain screening tests have been shown to be more efficacious than others. You know, my reading of the literature for cervical smear tests show that they really do um, prevent or, or, or reduce your risk of an aggressive cervical cancer. For breast cancer, does it save lives that are having mammograms? Possibly not. Um, so I think it's really individual to the test and, and the person, and it doesn't take away from the fact that the best thing you can do is address your individual behavior. Mm -hmm. I, I agree 100%. The, the research and the statistics with the mammograms is very, very interesting. And at what age is it actually potentially beneficial? It's much later than that's touted by in certain agencies in the United States. But if you bring this up, this topic, just looking at the science and the numbers, which are pretty straightforward, because doctors don't read that, they don't consume the literature and understand it. It's a very emotional topic. Like it's, you, you almost have to be ready for a fight. The so like, you know, but I had a patient that was 40 that was saved by a mammogram. I was like, well, it's probably because you found a lump and that's why you got the mammogram. So it's not yeah. because she was getting screening at 40. And um, so, yeah, it's, it is a very tough situation. And to, to talk with patients, it, it takes a time and it's calming in a, but uh, don't disregard, it can be helpful. But I, I always see these as, I tell patients, this is an early detection device, not necessarily prevention in the sense that it's yeah. preventing because we're yeah. just looking for something that's wrong. Yeah, for sure. And by the state, by the time that's become apparent, you know, yeah. Um, it, it, yeah, you, you've sort of, yeah, you want to have got, you want to be in that prevention phase of, right. of trying to, to address diet and lifestyle. You can tell I'm a little bit uncomfortable about talking about these things because yeah. it's just so ingrained in our, our training that you have to, you, you should yeah. adopt all the policies that your government tell you are good for you. And yeah. you know, for the national healthcare system, I don't get the choice to, to, uh, yeah. you know, to, to, to tell, to discuss maybe openly with patients as much as I would like. Yeah. It is a very tricky balance being in the fields that we've chosen of lifestyle medicine because a lot of times patients will regard that as you only choose, um, you know, lifestyle modification and diet and nothing else matters. But like, no, we have to walk this balance <laughs> between, you know, westernized medicine and proven technologies and interventions that are helpful with the lifestyle modifications that we're ignoring in <laughs> traditional medicine and marry those two together and, and make that help the patient navigate that as well. And it just, yeah. it takes a lot of communication and support and, and mm -hmm. patience. Um, yeah. And, uh, but yet it's really an interesting, very interesting populations to walk in the middle of. It's like, we're the, we're the moderates and then there's the mm -hmm. other ones, but it's, it's a, it's a interesting situation for sure. But mm -hmm. you're not the only one that feels uncomfortable talking about it because it is such a delicate <laughs> topic but I, I had to ask because I do get those questions a lot and um, my do. question yeah I, a lot a whole lot like because um, my mother had breast cancer her mother and all their sister were BRCA gene negative um, but they were older they were you know closer to 60 they also did not lead the lives that I am leading um, when they were diagnosed and treated and um, they had other mitigating factor or other promoting factors like you know estrogen supplementation way beyond where they should have. I mean, so there was a lot of factors going on there. So I just say, you know, this is a personal decision. I'll walk you through the evidence and let's make that decision together. But the final decision rests on your shoulders and I'll support you in whatever you choose. And so that's kind of how I, I go, I walk around that. So, <laughs> so, but um, thank you so much. And is there any final advice that you have for anyone maybe who's facing the diagnosis of cancer or has a loved one that they're caring for with cancer. And, you know, we're, because, you know, I also hear from patients, you know, who have an oncologist and they don't speak to them about nutrition and they don't speak to them about other factors and they just feel alone and isolated in a really scary time. And so anything there that you found to be helpful or, or would recommend? Yeah, well, as you say, I think it's just nice to be able to find the support you need because it's really hard to go through this without 
um, you know, a supportive environment. Not everyone is is lucky enough to, you know, to have that one person or family that will help them through it or even think about things in the same way. So, you know, seek out your local support groups because people get a lot of um, strength from speaking to other people who've gone through the same thing, the same treatments, you know, even it's difficult for me to talk to, to patients about what it's like to have to go through chemotherapy. I've never had to do it. So, you know, it, it's really good to sort of find a local support group um, and, you know, seek out the information that, um, that, that you need. You know, your doctor is never going to know everything um, about your particular situation, but there will always be people around that you can reach out out to you know for for the uk we have a great macmillan cancer support and uh, you know access to dietitians and, and things and you know make sure you get that information that that you you need and you know be kind to yourself because you can't it's really tough it's really tough for anyone to go through and nobody you know does it perfectly in inverted commas and things won't always go to plan so i think you know, it's best not to be too rigid or too hard on yourself when things may not have gone right or you didn't eat a really healthy meal or, or whatever. You know, I think everyone's working and, and getting through cancer the best that they can. And, you know, there is good news because, you know, after cancer therapy, you can you can make a great impact um, through lifestyle choices. So it really isn't ever too late to change um, so not to put too much pressure and small changes will have a positive impact. Absolutely. Definitely tiny changes make huge impact. Just one more question. It came to me as you were talking <laughs> is, you know, we hear about people saying, well, I'm getting chemotherapy, but I've been advised not to eat a high antioxidant diet. Does a high antioxidant diet affect chemotherapy? Um, you know, it's effect efficacy. Well, not, not that I've ever heard of, not in the field I work in, to be honest. No, I mean, you know, that would mean avoiding all the fruits and vegetables and things, which sounds completely counterintuitive and against all the guidelines. So I, I can't think why that would be. There's never been any food interaction that's been Thank negative. You. Bar a couple of drugs I, I use that interact with liver enzymes. So, you know, <laughs> the virology of the grapefruits keep come up with drugs that interact with, um, you know, liver enzymes. But but that's about it, really. So I, I don't Thank think you. I've ever heard of Anything you would else. be amazed at how many times I've been asked that question. I mean, I, I don't know. It's because I'm, I'm constantly on, you know, podcasts and webinars and doing things, but in a wide variety of patients, but I was like, I'm pretty sure you should be eating a healthy diet during chemotherapy, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I'll ask some of the experts and see what they say. So that's reassuring. So good. <laughs> well, thank you again. And I, I promise I, I'll just email you if I have any other questions. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. Well, maybe one last thing for, for me as a plug, you know, as Plant-Based Health Professionals UK, we've had to move all our education program online, which has sort of been a great thing for us in a way because it's made our education more accessible. So we have a fortnightly webinars um, on at the moment. Oh, awesome. And, and actually um, this month is really busy. It's run by one of our nutritionists, Rahini Bajekal. And um, we're actually hosting one of your uh, fellow American colleagues, um, Sarai Stansik, because we're yes. hosting her movie. Oh. And then she's going to get, because we can't go and watch the movie anywhere together. So we're doing an online viewing and then she's coming on to answer some questions. But we're also covering, um, you know, the impact of, COVID on the BAME community next week and we've got um, wow. diet and fertility and so I'll send you a link to all our topics and yes anyone from anywhere can tune in depending on time zones I guess <laughs> I think that's fabulous thank you so much yeah, I think that's a wonderful resource and the beauty of the internet and is is that we're allowing us to access resources from everywhere around the world mm -hmm. to just benefit everybody and it's it's only a positive uh, movement forward so thank you for offering that it's wonderful yeah. <laughs> all right well thank you everyone for listening and um thank you for sharing for you know we had to work out our time zones here halfway around the world it's so awesome that we can actually even do this and we so appreciate your time and, and sharing your expertise and and answering some pretty tough questions so i appreciate you so much <laughs> it's a pleasure all right Thank <laughs> you.